I mean, there was a, there was a handful of things from our first uh, meeting with Rob that we, we brought to the character. There was no movie before he, he reached out to us. We were trying to make something else. And, uh, you know, we had this desire to do, you know, a pulpy genre thriller, thrilling movie that actually thrills you and feels like you're going to fall off the throne of your seat. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I, having gotten to know him in that brief time that we met, I immediately saw like a Vietnam War vet and someone who's just like constantly trying to you know, avoid the world and uh, in a way that the, that the character, that we brought that to the character. Okay, slow down a little bit. So you get a, an email out of the blue from Robert and you guys have never met before. No. And what was your first thought when you got the email? He's not right for the movie that we <laughs> We had a long conversation. We're like, what, what do we do with this? If it wasn't for Sebastian Beverly Clark, who's here, the producer, I, I wouldn't. I might not have even responded. No, I, of course I would have responded, but it would have been a different response. He was like, I was like, what do I do? Because I need to write him back. <laughs> what did he say? I didn't get my email. <laughs> Report to junk. Yeah. Robert, what? Can you put into words a little more about what about their work was so appealing to you that drew you? Um, I mean, initially it was just some kind of weird instinct, and then I saw the trailer for what well, I saw him as what, and I, I just liked. Um, uh, I, I mean, obviously, I really like the energy it brings to movies, and even in Daddy Long Legs as well. It's like it kind of even it's like slightly more like slightly less extreme, but it's still. Kind Frenetic and electric, um, and I, th I think it's a really, really difficult thing to do. And um, I like that, and I also like the performance and having those work with the, the seamlessness between the world of the movie and the real world around it. And I, I just really want to be in that kind of like a true ensemble. So, so tell us then about how this story came about. I was, I, I you know, when we first started talking to one another, it was, I was in. Just reading Executioner song by Norma Mailer for the first time, and the brother book in the Belly of the Beast, and also produced by, published by Norma Mailer. And I was, I just downloaded every episode of, Cop, of Cops, the greatest American TV show, and just watching it. We were just watching before we left for the other scene. And uh, I mean, it's just there's a there was a there's always been a fascination uh, and an obsession with the American criminal and the prison ethos in America and how trapped everyone is. And, and breaking free, I'm always trying to break free, and I hate time more than anything in the world, so I call it good time. But like, I, I really can't stand time, and I just want to create the illusion that it doesn't exist, and that's why I love movies so much, is because we get we come into these dark rooms, and you just like time travel in a weird way. But then, then you have a movie like Good Time, where time is so important. You know, it's a, we can't help but escape that impending minute mark. But it's, it's time distilled to its. In terms speaking, in, in terms of time, like that. And before we wrote the screenplay, I, uh, you know, because Rob, you know, isn't the character. He's, you know, he, there's parts of him in it, but he's very far from the character. That speaks to his incredible performance, uh, and and of course Benny's performance. Mm -hmm. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> uh, I, we we had to basically know who this person was inside out, and I did obsessive work in developing the backstory. And I realized we couldn't we couldn't overlook a three month gap. So it's like when he's born, all the way up until like, and as he got closer to the beginning of the movie, he got like every day, um, every day he was released from prison, what he did and how he did, what he his interactions with Nick and the grandmother, and uh, it just let us know the characters so well that when we put ourselves as writers, me and Ronald, like we just knew exactly what this guy would do. Well, one of the things that I saw uh, in reading about the film was that. You mentioned cops that you, you kind of wanted wanted to pursue one of these characters that you might see in cops. Mm -hmm. Like, what's his day to day life like when he's not in front of these cameras, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you were were developing all this backstory and developing all these characters, Robert, you were on another film. You were getting you were like somewhere else getting notes sent back and forth from these guys, yeah. Um, further away, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, and a long time before that as well, I, mean, I think, I don't know if you sent me an initial draft of the script first or if it was, I feel like I, I, I was just always being sent stuff, whether it was just images of uh, people's mugshots who were just kind of just felt sort of right, or whether it was uh, this documentary, A Year in the Life of Crime, solved. Um, HBO documentary, uh, and uh, but 
also there would be a, a few scenes at the time and then the backstory would come and it would kind of come piecemeal from all over the place so it's kind of a, 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 an organic kind of web that came um, and rewrites of the scripts and new drafts blah, blah, blah. and it was just over a really really long period of time and I kept those it's, it's, it's strangely satisfying to see even if pieces of a character uh, are abandoned I really want to know more about your preparation process. I mean, the transformation that we saw in Robert in this film was astounding. I, I just was blown away by this. Can you talk a bit about how you went about preparing for the role? There's a physicality there that's incredible, and um, you know, obviously vocally, and as Josh said, your your upbringing is pretty far afield from that. <laughs> <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts in Yonkers, yeah, it's near the, 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 then we went to a garage where a friend of mine has and spent about eight hours there and, and just listening to stories and, and then picking up on one story and then this guy was like, oh, I know exactly this type of guy, I know who Connie is, and he took us on a walking tour of his recently deceased brother, yeah. and it was just like this really peculiar, really incredibly independent guy, uh, and we were walking around at these personal landmarks, this guy in Rocky Point, Long Island, and we were just, couldn't even believe it, he's like, yeah, this is where he thought he killed the guy and he buried him, but he didn't bury him deep enough. So the guy came out and like walked down the street and I saw him right there covered in dirt. But like the story we were reliving them, we were like taking pictures almost. It was it was it was awesome. I mean we really it was great. I mean Rob really constantly was saying, like, I wanna meet someone else, I wanna meet someone else and that was great for me. Like going went to Manhattan Detention Center in jail and through my weird research I ended up kind of becoming friends with the commissioner of jails of New York City. And uh, strangely, I met him and someone kept calling him the commission. I was like, why did he call me the commission? He's like, oh, I'm a commissioner. I was like, commissioner of what? And he's like, 137th Street. He's like, oh, commissioner of jails of New York City, five boroughs. And I was like, wow, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, anytime you want to come, I'll show you whatever you want. So we went down to the Manhattan <laughs> Center and he was not, Connie wasn't able to speak yet, but we were developing the look and the vibe. And he 
wouldn't really open his mouth the entire time. And we went through a really in-depth tour where we were, where the inmates thought that we were like working for the government. And we were like, <laughs> like uh, you know, inmate outreach. And they were like, yo, let me talk to you. Were you dressed in the suit? I was, I was dressed in the car salesman suit, yeah. <laughs> and I, uh, yeah, no, we were, it was, it was incredible. And, and it, it, was, it was amazing to see him kind of start, you know, when you raise the stakes on an actor, on a performer, like, listen, you have to become someone because the stakes of being shouted, at, shouted out and called out are, are not only embarrassing, but also like, they're real, you know what I mean? It's just like someone screams, hey, Rob Pattinson, what are you doing in jail? Like, you know, yeah. Yeah. Someone, someone did think I was at the Sky Street. In a weird way, I would argue it's almost more frightening to be called out in the Dunkin' Donuts. Such a small. Also, Benny, you were in character. I know, but you were being really difficult with the guy. Yeah, I I was ordering a very specific thing. I had a very specific order I wanted in mind, and and Connie clearly knew that. And they were treating me in a specific way. And then then for for Rob, I was like, okay, this is what it's like to have Nick in the world, you know, with him. And it was just awesome for me also to see feel what it's like to have this guy as my brother. You know, what is that like? How does how does he care about my wants or feelings and or does he care you know these certain things that are very helpful but getting called out in that dunkin donuts it's a very small they're all very small like when they're there you know so if you it's kind of it's very embarrassing it's like in jail yeah it's scary but in the dunkin donuts there's something more existential about it you know thank you more embarrassing for him in jail <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're behind their they're, they're, in, they're in jail <laughs> I want to ask you about um, your preparation process too, Benny, for, for the role of Nick. Uh, you, you had put on some uh, weight at the time that you guys were about to shoot this. For, you were preparing for another role, I guess, right? Well, yes. In 2010, um, with Ronald uh, Bronstein, we were going to make a movie where I kind of went through my own, I mined my own emotions and feelings and kind of came up with like the, the foundation for for what we didn't know was Nick at the time was Jordan. And I developed this way of talking that I could that I could use and then Speech and kind of Yeah. Movie. And so everything became this character Jordan and we were gonna make a movie with him. We filmed a bunch of rehearsals and it, it, the movie never ended up happening, but we had this 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 person who existed in this fictional reality that just never ended up happening. And then seven years later, it's like, okay, what, let's revisit this character. And then, because I had put on, I had, I put on weight for another role, like actual muscle, and then we did an interview to, for the financiers and it, to kind of to say, like, hey, I can, play the, I can play this part, I can be this person. And so I came in as Jordan, I did the, I talked to the, I went in thinking I was gonna get money from this woman, I wasn't quite sure what was happening. And it got very uncomfortable in the in the room, and I said, "Can I leave?" And she said, "Yes, of course. I'm mean, not I'm not holding you here." You know, so I got up and left. We sent it to the financiers, and like that guy's great. Let's cast him. And they didn't know it was me. And I, was like, I had seen these people. I'd spoken to them, but after watching that, I realized, okay, I, there was a physicality now. This guy could take whatever he wants when he wants. So there's going to be a hardening of his own feelings, like, and it's going to be even harder to get inside. Whereas before he was a little bit younger. And not Strong, so he could. He, there was a little bit more. You can you could mold him more, but now he's had seven years of just. And then that. throw into the mix that Benny just had a baby. Benny just had a, his son, and two weeks before we started shooting, wow. and it was just like that added to the melee of, of it all, kind of for him. And you know the, uh, the adding to the grit and the authenticity of the film. There's a lot of street casting. There's a lot of uh, actors who you know didn't come from the acting world. Some of these. Uh, guys were doing their first appearances on film. Talia, is it? Talia, yeah, yeah, who plays Crystal, yeah. Who plays a 16-year-old girl, and um, and the guy at the front who is uh, Peter Verby. Peter Verby, who is the the uh, counselor. Yeah. Um, he was, where did he's he come a, from? he's a cinephile in New York who uh, was actually kind of part of that other project that we were talking about from 2010. But he he's a criminal lawyer. He was a public defender. He. You know, he was a part of the character building. Him and Rob sat down a bunch and talked about the type of people that he, you know, represented and, and how they act. He was an advisor. In a way, yeah. I mean, he's also just honestly, like, he just oozes. He's like Big Bird, you know? He just is like, <laughs> so sweet. And like, having that presence in such an institutional place 
was really, you know, kind of, uh, it was interesting. It was like, sorry, I don't know what's happening here. Oh, cool. Uh, I got it. I thought there was like a, take away. Um, yeah, he's incredible. But a lot of, throughout the movie, you see, you know, like, the guy, the commissioner of jail shows up in the intake. You know, he's the shaped head guy. That's, he, he could dictate the scene really well. Some of the inmates in, in the day room scene are, are friends or friends of friends or people who street casting met through halfway houses and they were dictating the the, well, the blocking. We, 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 we were talking about, okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna block this way and then um, Jerome just says it wouldn't go down like that. Like, what do you mean? And then he starts telling us exactly how it would happen. And so we pull over the sun quarter and be like, okay, listen to him, this is how it's gonna go. And just kind of being open to that and being open to because we wanted to make a thriller, we wanted to make something that was entertaining, but at the same time actually had a real sense of kind of danger that, in, because it was enmeshed with reality. Well, okay, you did that. <laughs> uh, here. Beyond the bonds of brotherly love, do you think there was something else driving Connie's need to protect his brother at all costs? Drive. So was it last part of the question? Well, beyond just being, you know, the brothers and the brotherly love, was there anything else driving Connie's need to protect his brother at all costs? I mean, I don't necessarily know if he's even protecting him at all. I think he's kind of putting him like he wants to. He he just wants to love him in the way that he thinks is right, and he thinks because he loves him. some ways he wants to protect him from what he, uh, institutions he deems as, uh, as immoral and, and, and not working for him. But he's, I mean, he's a very controlling uh, brother. I mean, he kind of, he just, he decides everything for Nick. Um, and, you know, I guess you could see that as protective. But I mean, it's really, <laughs> yeah, narcissism is powerful. Because yeah, he doesn't. I think he doesn't want to be. He doesn't want to be wrong. You know, like if he's wrong, then there's also yeah. There's a, I mean, there's also another thing as well. Is he, like Connie, does, like there's a line in the beginning when uh, he's taking him out of the. Is that what do you think it's called? Hospital. Yeah. The beginning. Yeah. Right. yeah. And they walk past other people in the hospital, and he's like, "Is that what you think you are?" Is that what you and it's like this kind of. Clearly has like something like which I mean, he's definitely challenged in some way, and Connie just believes like because you're my brother, you don't have that, and it's kind of it's a sort of fairly I've seen it in people I know like who have a sibling who, who has <laughs> kind of some kind of uh, challenges, and just because it's so difficult, and it's like they don't, and because they are connected to them, they like sort of refuse to accept it, and um, and it's a very difficult thing to accept when it's part of of your family and but like yeah, this is yeah, I think probably not the right way to approach it. <laughs> I mean I think that Connie I, I see the world somewhat through Connie's eyes. I, I believe I agree with him. That I, I agree with his kind of animosity towards the institution. I know I think I agree with him that you can't change the mind from the outside. You can only change it from the inside. And that the only way you can change it from the inside is through an experience and the only way to kind of induce an experience is to force someone to do something. That idea I really agree with. Maybe the execution to try to, you know, get that across isn't the best. Maybe bringing his brother to rob a bank is not the best idea. But, you know, it is an idea, and I really respect Connie has a lot of ideas. I like people's ideas. Connie has, like, he has a logic that's maybe flawed, but there is a, you can kind of see where he's going, and then as an audience, you're just like, you're, you're taking on this ride and you, you don't have time to look back. So you kind it's of also like majorly part of the disenfranchised of America, you know, like, I mean, he's definitely one of, one of the 40% of people who did, just don't, did not vote in the last election. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, definitely. You know, I mean, his speech, his speech that he gives to Ray at the end, you know, is, is uh, well, I mean, he's a con, so he can't, ex-con, he can't actually vote, but, uh, you know, he, his speech that he gives to Ray at the end is like, you know, straight out of like Libertarian 101, you know, he's like, no government, fuck the government, let's keep it small, like, you shouldn't lean on anyone but yourself, and, you know, ideally, you know, that's great, but, you know, I think the end, what makes the end interesting is that, you kind of have to have faith in the institutional way. You have to have faith in the system because the system does sometimes have, you know, good intentions. Can I, I would ask about the masks. Like, those masks were, are made in LA. They are made by a company named SPFX. The government has asked them to stop making those masks because so many people rob banks with them. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and the exact masks that were used in the movie are masks that when we were writing the script, a guy in Ohio, Polish guy, white guy, that was robbing banks uh, as you know, disguised as, a, as an African American, and he—they're just generic African American masks. Well, they're not generic. They're actually modeled off of a very specific person. They're very <laughs> high. They're very high in quality. They, they form to your face. What person? I don't know. I mean, well, the, the, what's what? The craziest story about the Ohio bank robberies were that was that when they threw the surveillance image out on like you know news and stuff, a, a woman was was you know, watching TV and she saw this image, she's like, oh my God, my son robbed a bank. <gasps> and she called the police and she said, go and arrest him, how dare him. And he was working at, some, at a restaurant and he arrested him. He was like, I didn't do anything. He's like, yeah, right. Yeah, there and was then they arrested him and then question. Wow. Yeah, without question, of course, you're a black man, of course you committed a crime. So, I mean, that's like the movie, you know, our movie is like a, is a piece of, is entertainment, but it's also like great genre movies that I love is trying to be a reflection of the times. I mean that's that happened. That happened while we were writing the movie, and at the end, and when as you know, Connie again, he's playing into the the, the fucked up ways of the world right now. And he's in the amusement park, and and you're making a thriller a movie about plausibility, and he swaps outfits with Barkhad Abdi's character, and those cops, those two white cops, walk in and they don't question anything. They just accept it as fact, and then the scene immediately following is. The all the other people, who, the only two people who are detained are two people of color, and they're they're guilty, you know. And he and he knows that. It's, it's it's actually that look that he gives to Leah is like almost kind of like, I played the system, and I hate the system, you know what I mean? And like, I'm just you know I'm just trying to survive, and this like, but the cool the, the cool thing about the movie for me is that like you watch this thing, and no one probably. People probably just been like, yeah, that's plausible, and that's fucked up, that it's plausible, <laughs> you know. And like, that's the great genre movies of like, you know, the westerns in the sixties, seventies, all about the Vietnam War, Dawn of the Dead, Rest in Peace, George Romero, you know, it's messing with race issues, and also like the suburban plight, people being zombies, obviously Night of the Living Dead, Last House on the Left. I mean, there's there's a way to to kind of expose reality in a in like a subversive way, and that's definitely something that we were after. It was a pulpy thing. Uh, Rob, was it hard? To, was it hard to learn the accent? It's from Vicky. Learn it. Learn it. Both. 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 Learn to learn. It. I earned is a good way of thinking. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, kind of. It's kind of. Uh, it's just you just assimilate. Really. I mean, if you ever had enough time to. Uh, to I had like two months. Kind of had, I had some really good kind of examples of voices. One of them was in the previous movie, and I just got him to talk to me a lot <laughs> and, and, and read the script a bunch. But I mean, yeah, it, it was just good. We were, the people, a lot of the people who were in the world of the movie were around in the production office, and and uh, were we in Queens, right? The, the yeah, first Long Island City. Well, yeah, it was just kind of. Well, uh, these other two questions we kind of answered. So, uh, in closing, I just want to my style. <laughs> I talk a lot. And there are, I have no there question. Are um, what's What's next? Can we, what else are you guys working on that we can? For all three of us, we're, we're doing a movie in the in the, uh, the top of the year next year about the Diamond District. Uh, it's about the Blink culture, the Bukharian and Jews, and the, you know, uncut gems, sold out cut gems. Yeah, it's a, it's another thriller. It's a big big movie. This comes out of your own lives. 
Yeah, our dad was a runner for the Diamond District when we were kids, and uh, he had one specific boss who was just, it actually we took his name uh, for the movie, and he's, he was an incredible, very eccentric guy, but uh, not not like Jacob the Jeweler type. Jacob the Jeweler is the guy who introduced, you know, Pop Daddy to music video culture to, you know, specific type of jewelry. And then he went to jail for like four years. Well, to that. Well, this film's out next week, and then, uh, Rob, can you tell us anything that you're working on next that we can hear about, or? Uh, I'm just about to start a movie with Claire Denis. Um, and what? With Claire Denis. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that? I guess, it's a French story. Uh, there's like, kind of, fashion and jewelry, uh, house, and then electrical buy, and wine material, and stuff, and many things that anyone here should watch her new she's done, because she never made a bad movie ever. Huh. Um, and then, it's like an ex-con in space, right? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a favorite out, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming.